Luke chapter 12. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, ask you to watch over us this evening, pray that you'd give me the exact words to speak, uh, that this would be a, a blessing to the people, pray that you'd open hearts in Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask a question tonight that scripture asks and then give you a scriptural answer for it. And the question is, what is your life? What is your life? Now, the Bible teaches us a lot about life. Uh, it tells us when life began, it, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul. Uh, it tells us when life begins at conception. So those things the, uh, the, uh, the scripture teaches us very clearly. But it also asks us the question, what is your life? Uh, and it, it compares our life to a lot of different things. Uh, in James 4.14, it says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth a little time and then vanisheth away. Uh, James 1, verses 9 and 10, compares our life to grass. He says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Uh, Job 7, 6 uh, compares our life to a weaver's shuttle. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And that, uh, that particular verse and that comparison takes me back to my grandfather. He, had, he worked in a mill, and uh, he was a, a loom fixer. He was there to keep that loom operating. And I know I've seen pictures of them. They, they go so fat you just can't see it happen. And that's comparing a comparison to our life. But then also in Job, in chapter 6, verse 7, we're compared to the wind. It says, oh, remember that my life is wind. It's here and it's gone. It's compared to a flower. Uh, it says that man that is born of a woman is of a few days and a full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And of course, we're com our life is compared to dust. It says, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall be no more. So that's what the scripture talks about, about our life. But I tell you, the world's got a completely different picture. Uh, according to the world, uh, your life is built around the things that you have. You know, the gadgets, the cars, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of miles of highways. You can get all kinds of cookers now that cooks your food. They've even got it now that it comes and you just hold a card in front of a microwave and it cooks it for you. Uh, all these different things, all these different machines, and people think that 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 is life. But how many people actually have a life? Um, most people by the time, and I, this kind of shocked me, but it uh, turned out to be pretty accurate, that most people by the time they are 35 have given up on living. They live simply because they have to. Uh, they, have a, they have bills to pay, people that need them. They have places to go, but they don't really enjoy it. And I looked this up today, and this, this is frightening in a way. Uh, each year, approximately 24,000 college students attempt suicide. Uh, in the age group 18 to 24, suicide is the number three killer after accidental deaths, and there was one other one. So people, they're not happy with the life that they have. But when we come here to, to Luke chapter 12, uh, starting here in verse 15, the Lord uh, gives us some thoughts uh, about life and what's going on. Uh, he, he gives us a contradiction here. In verse 15, he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. 
Now, that's not what the world thinks. The world thinks life is what you have. I've got to have a nicer car. I've got to have a bigger house uh, and all of these things. And that is not really what life is all about. Uh, Georgine and I uh, knew an uh, older couple, uh, haven't been able to see them for several years. Uh, both of them had uh, ill health, uh, different things about them. But uh, they were two of the happiest people, the liveliest people I've ever met. Uh, they loved the Lord. Um, the, the man, he witnessed to a stump. Uh, he just served the Lord. And, and that's what, that, they, they had life. Uh, people look at them and say, oh, you know, they're not quite all there. Yeah, they were. And they were, they were living life the way that it ought to be lived. And so the Lord comes here starting in verse 16, and he gives us a parable. He teaches us a lesson here uh, by this uh, rich fool. Uh, starting in verse 16, it says there that uh, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So here we have a, a, pro, a prosperous man. He's a farmer. He knows how to plant his crops, knows what to do, uh, apparently has no real problems to speak of. Uh, things have worked out very well for him. Uh, he's very happy with, uh, with what's going on. Uh, and the, the idea there is, you know, he, he's happy. Uh, but happy is because of happenings. Joy comes from deep within. So people can be happy uh, for a few minutes. Uh, it's like somebody buys a new car. Oh, they're glad they got a new car until the payment book comes in the mail. Uh, and the happiness disappears. Uh, so we've got to be careful what we base our thinking on. Um, if we're not happy, we don't think anything about that we don't have life. So he was a very prosperous man. He, his, his ground brought forth plentifully. But then I also see he's a pondering man. He thought about things. Uh, there in verse 17, it says, And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. This man, he's got a dilemma. He'd reached his limit. Uh, his, his barns aren't big enough. What's he going to do about the future? Uh, he wasn't thinking anything about uh, his, his soul, uh, heaven, or any of those things. He was thinking totally about a life of ease. He'd run out of room, couldn't have, didn't have room to store his crops uh, to, for his money, his investments. And so his idea, he sat down and thought about it, and he says, well, uh, I've got some decisions to make. And so in verse 18, he says, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he says, what I need to do is just tear down what I've got build back bigger, and it'll hold everything I've got. So he was, again, planning for his future, but not thinking about uh, anything about after uh, he passed on what was going to be taking place. But then also there in verse 19, he was somewhat of, of a philosophical person. It says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat drink and be merry. Um, he probably spent more time talking to himself than he did anybody else. Uh, he was used to talking to himself. Uh, he saw things a little deeper than, than some people might see. And so he says, you know, uh, I've, got to, I've got to take care uh, uh, of my goods. I've got these goods laid up for many years uh, eat, drink, and be merry. He was, a, he was very happy, very content. Uh, he thought he was very blessed because of uh, all his much goods. But there again, he's missing the key part. And that's in verse 20, uh, when God stepped on the scene. <clears throat> and God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He turned out to be a very foolish man. God called him a fool. 
He had made no thought about God. Uh, there was no thankfulness to God for what uh, he had been blessed with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he had made no time or effort seeking God's will. All he was seeking was, was pleasure. Uh, his only thought about life was um, the things that he wanted, what he was thinking about, my fruit, my barn, my goods, my decisions, my plans, my dreams, my future, my life. But the most important thing he left out, and that was God and his relationship to him. And so God shows up and he says, uh, rich man, you're a fool. You've made no uh, provision for, your, for the life after you pass. Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So that night, that rich man was going to pass and uh, face, face a creator uh, that he had no relationship with. Um, the things that we possess all our life and I've lived, uh, the things that we've done really make no uh, difference, not any help at that moment when we meet God. Uh, when you go to Revelation, the great white throne judgment, it's the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the kings and the paupers all stand equally before God. If I can put it there, you stand there naked. There's nothing you've got. Uh, you left everything behind. And the only thing you've got is, do you have a relationship with God or not? Of course, when those of us were saved, when we stand before God, we're going to have on a robe of righteousness. Um, we'll not have to stand before him in judgment. So what this man forgot was that the only thing that really mattered uh, was his soul. He was not rich toward God. Uh, there in verse 21, it says, So then, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Uh, he was laying up the wrong kind of treasure. Uh, Matthew 16, 26 says, For what is a man profiteth? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So you think about this person, and of course this took place, you know, two th the story here 2,000 years ago. But I thought of some people, bring this up to date, uh, that would fall into this category. I thought about Marilyn Monroe. 36 years old, drug overdose. Kurt Cor Corbain, 27 years old, years old uh, blew his head off with a shotgun. Heath Ledger, 28, acute combined drug and alcohol intoxication. Jimi Hendrix, 28 years old, the peak of his career and a drug overdose. And, you know, I, I like to watch the older programs. Um, you don't have to worry about the cussing and all of that in them. And a lot of times when I see someone on that program, uh, I'll look up them and find out, you know, what happened to them. And to my surprise, a lot of the ones that you would think would, would in their own thinking, have life easy, alcohol, drugs, you know, they died early. Um, their, their life just ended too soon. And that's what Jesus is trying to, to teach here, that uh, our life is, is, is brief. And we've got to make sure in that time uh, that we have the right relationship with him. And he gives us a challenge there, starting there in verse 22. And he talk, says, he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which uh, neither have storehouse nor barns, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? 
So he challenges the disciples uh, to think about uh, the things that, uh, you know, we think may, may, be, too, may be important, you know. Uh, and he says, take no thought for these things. No thought for what you'll eat, what you're clothed with. Uh, he says, God knows what you need. Uh, and that, I have to admit, that can be a struggle at times because, you know, when times get lean and you wonder, Lord, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to handle this? And uh, the Lord always comes through on time and, and gives you what you need and uh, takes care of us. He used the examples here of a raven. Um, you know, they're a, a scavenger bird, but God takes care of them. He provides food for them. And then he talks about uh, our, uh, our height. Can we, we can't worry and make ourselves an inch taller. Uh, we can't do any of those things. Uh, it's all in God's hands. And then he uses the illustration there in verse 27 and 28 about the lilies. He says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And I, I think about that. I, I like flowers. I like to look at them, don't know how to raise them, don't know anything about them. But when you look at just the, the multitude of different flowers that God has put on this earth and the beauty that's in them, and uh, he's saying if, if God takes care of those, he will take care of us. But look at verse, starting there in verse 29, he says, he says, Seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto thee. He says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdoms. So he says here, you know, just start trusting God. Uh, there in verse 28, he uses the term, O ye of little faith. And then in verse 29, he says, Neither be of a doubtful mind. Just trust God that he is going to provide for the needs that you have. Our life is wrapped up in the Lord. Uh, if we will allow him to work in our life, uh, we can really see what life is really all about. And he makes a, a point here. Uh, he says that I am come that you might have life and that you might have more and that more abundant. It's John 10.10. 10. Now that's what Jesus, he says, I want to give you life, but I want it to be more abundant life. Uh, more abundant than what? Well, more than the things that we want to purchase, more of those things. And you think about all the things that God has promised us, uh, that we do truly have uh, a more abundant life. Excuse me just a second here. My sinuses have been running crazy. But think about 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many people do we know in this world today that would love to have a sound mind? Uh, you know, they're, they're worried, they're upset, and they're, there's no peace, they can't sleep at night. I tell you, when you trust in the Lord and know Him, you lay down and you go to sleep. Uh, if He takes you, He takes you. Uh, and we can have peace. Uh, John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Uh, we have the peace that only he can give us. Then, of course, John 14, 1 and 2, he gives us a home in heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. All of these things that he's given us, the promises that we can have, uh, and it, 
when we take these into account, we truly do have a great life. Hebrews 13, 5 says, He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then Deuteronomy tells us, The eternal God is my, thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. So what has God promised? He's promised us himself, uh, that he is going to be the one to, to take care of us. And the idea there, the everlasting arms, and it, the, the expression is used in the scripture that he would gather, talking about Israel, the Lord said, I would have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chicks. And I know uh, when uh, my Georgine's uh, dad was alive, uh, he liked to farm and they had a chicken pen. And if the wrong kind of shadow went over, uh, there was a mama chicken was gathering up all them little ones, uh, protecting those little chicks. And that's what the Lord does for us. He, he protects us. He watches over us. Um, and I think one verse that really kind of sets it all, uh, 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. What is our life? Our life ought to be wrapped up in the Lord. Uh, he is our life. He is our light. Uh, he is all that we need. He's promised to take care of us, to provide for us. And uh, Georgie and I both, we can tell you time and time again how God is, has provided things that we needed that, you know, I look back on it and I say, how did we put three kids through Christian school from kindergarten through college? And I say, my checkbook can't tell you how, but God did it. Uh, and DJ will tell you to this day that one of the greatest blessings that, that really helped build his faith we had gone up to Connecticut to a church up there. Uh, was, I had gone to school with the pastor. And uh, he was really having some troubles. That the Catholic church just down the street were doing everything. And he was really having a tough time. And we were with him there for the week. And on Sunday night, uh, service was over. And Georgine and I started, you know, I started walking down to get her to go to the back of the church. And the pastor said, wait just a minute. And the back door of the church opened, and the ladies brought in sack after sack after sack of groceries. They called it a they call it there a pounding. And when we got it back to the trailer and the kids saw the stuff, you know, they're saying, Look, mom, it's Jif. It's real peanut butter, you know. <laughs> but God proved that even to our own kids that He will take care if we would just put our life in his hands, he's promised to take care of us. So when we say, what is your life? My life is Christ. Amen. If you go ahead and uh, bow your heads for just a moment while uh, John Joe comes with a song.